we'll give everybody just a minute or two to join in. Love your picture, Dan. <laughs> Give it just another minute or two. Let a few more of the attendees pop in. All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending our webinar today. Uh, my name is Samuel Young. With us tonight, we have Dr. Ashley Miller, Dr. Daniel Sage, and Preeti Sa. Uh, we, to, for tonight, uh, just for all the attendees to know, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, everybody who wants to submit a question, feel free to open up the Q&A tab at any point. Um, you should see the button right in your meeting control bar during the webinar. Uh, with that, I will give it over to Preeti. Good evening, everyone. My name is Preeti Shah, and I'm the Orthopedic Service Line Administrator. Welcome. This program is brought to you by Berkshire Orthopedic Associates and Berkshire Medical Center. Berkshire Orthopedic Associates has offices in North Adams, Pittsfield, and Great Barrington to serve our community and make it convenient for our patients. Tonight, we have two of our surgeons here who are going to present to you latest in hip and knee replacement surgeries and joint replacement program at Berkshire Medical Center. Our first presenter is Dr. Daniel Sage. He earned his undergraduate degree at Cornell University and a master's degree in biology at New York University. He earned his medical degree at State University of New York at Downstate. He completed his residency and a fellowship in orthopedic surgery at Indiana University. He joined Berkshire Orthopedic Associates in 2018. He'll be presenting on hip replacement. Our second presenter for tonight is Dr. Ashley Miller. Dr. Miller is a magna cum laude graduate of Middlebury College. He earned his medical degree from the University of Vermont College of Medicine and completed his orthopedic surgical residency at University of Cincinnati. He joined Berkshire Orthopedics Associates last year. Dr. Miller is going to present on knee joint replacement options. Without further ado, here is Dr. Sage. Hi everyone. I'm just gonna wait for this screen to come up here. Let's see here. All right, great. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start off this talk. Um, I think we're gonna talk a little bit about the different types of arthritis and conservative treatment options. And then I'll veer in to talk about some hip replacement um, details. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Miller and he'll talk about uh, knee replacement. All right. Here's a nice picture of us. <laughs> All right, I've got no uh, conflicts of interest, but I do use uh, 
striker equipment. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, joint pain um, and the details in regards to that, and then we'll move on to treatment options, um, joint replacement surgery, and like I said, we'll, I'll talk about hip replacement, and Dr. Miller will talk about knee replacement, um, and then we'll kind of go on from there, recovery and Q&A. All right. So um, your joints are obviously involved in almost everything you do. Um, if you injure one of these joints, it can eliminate your ability to move and work. And I tell people, in fact, that it can affect other areas of the body. So if you hurt your hip or your knee and you start limping, um, you have other muscles in the body that can compensate um, or try to compensate, and that can lead to soreness in other areas of the body as well. So it really can affect everything. So here are some common causes of joint pain. The first type here, rheumatoid arthritis, is actually less common than the second type, osteoarthritis. Um, and it's a condition in which the person's immune system will attack the joints with inflammation, and that could potentially cause erosion of the joint. Uh, the second type, which is the more common one that we see, osteoarthritis, uh, really occurs with just the general wearing away of cartilage at the end of the femur and the tibia or up in the hip um, and the hip joint. There's also post-traumatic arthritis, uh, which is also less common, and that can be, occur from um, a fracture, uh, a, bro you know, a broken bone, and that can extend into the joint space, and that can cause the surface to become uneven. Um, so that's another, another type as well. So this is really important, you know, non-surgical treatment options. You know, all our patients, we always are recommending to try something non-surgical first because a lot of, a lot of times these, these options work quite well and can uh, potentially substitute or delay uh, surgery. So, you know, the first thing here, weight loss, that results in less force going, force going through the joint. You know, a human being puts three to four times their weight um, through their hip or knee when they're using stairs. So even losing 10 pounds, that's 30 to 40 pounds less pressure going through that joint that can improve uh, symptoms as well, slow down the progression of arthritis. Heat or cold therapy can be helpful as well. I find that cold therapy is generally better when it's on the joint itself. Heat is usually better for muscular type pain, um, but you can experiment with both. Um, physical therapy is another option. Uh, really, the physical therapy obviously isn't going to get rid of the arthritis, but really the philosophy behind therapy is that if you have pain, uh, that can lead to limping over time. And when you limp, you're firing your muscles less in your, in, uh, in your gait cycle. That leads to weakness. And then with the, when you put the same kinds of daily demands on a weak leg, uh, that can cause more pain. So the idea is to try to break that cycle and, uh, and strengthen the leg. And sometimes that can really help. And then down below, you see over-the-counter prescription anti-inflammatory medicines, um, anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, um, steroid medications like injections also can be helpful. Um, I would say that you know anti-inflammatory drugs, um, you have to be a little bit more careful with those. Those do have side effects like so many other medications as far as how much you're taking and how often. Um, steroids work quite well usually in the beginning. They do become less effective over time, however, um, and it's hard to predict over what period of time uh, that helps. Some people get a couple of years out of that strategy, other people six months and they're done. So, so uh, as far as when to con consider joint replacement, uh, I can kind of summarize this slide. Uh, I tell people it's all about function. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, you know, are you doing the things you like to do and need to do pain-free? Um, if you have hip or knee arthritis, and uh, you're able to manage this pain and, and therefore able to manage your function with non-surgical management, then I certainly advise you continue to do so. However, if you get to the point where you're unable to do the things you like to do or need to do because of pain, well then you, despite non-surgical management, then you're forced to make a decision. You either back off from what you're doing or you decide to get the surgery, which is a joint replacement. So, now I'm going to talk about hip replacement, and we'll just move on here. So here's some uh, just a animation here. So on the on the on the left of your screen, you'll see a healthy hip, and you see the pelvis and the acetabulum, which is also known as the hip socket, the femoral head, and the femur, which is your thigh bone. On the left, on the right, you can see that the cartilage. The cartilage is the smooth stuff that coats all the ends of your joints, allows the joints to glide glide smoothly. That that wears away, and that's what can cause pain. 
There it is. All right. And this is what we look at when we see you in clinic. Um, on the left, that's a normal hip. You see the ball and socket right there. And there's a kind of a dark space, you know, that we look at. That's where the cartilage is. You can't see cartilage on x-ray, but you know what's there based on the space that it keeps. And then if you look on the right on the arthritic hip, you can see that space is completely obliterated. So we know that it's a bad hip. All right, so total hip replacement, how it works. I believe this is an animation, although. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't get the animation to work. Okay, yeah. It's just to kind of summarize it basically, you know, you can see what that hip replacement looks like. I mean, I think that's a pretty accurate portrayal. Um, generally, the way it works is that the socket, we put a, we put a metal um, hemispherical socket where your bone socket is, and that's held into place via friction and sometimes with the use of screws. And then there's a plastic hemispherical liner that snaps into the socket. And then on the femoral end, um, you have you know, a stem that goes down into the femur uh, that's made of titanium. And then there's the head that goes on top of the, 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 uh, the femoral component. Um, and that's usually made of either metal or ceramic. I tend to use ceramic heads. So this just kind of summarizes what, what we just talked about here. So, right, you've got the four parts. You've got the stem, head, liner, and cup. And that's what an x-ray looks like when it's all done. So as you can see there, um, that's how it's, how it's supposed to look. And you know, I will add that you know, hip replacements really, um, you know, they're very successful surgeries. I mean, nothing's 100%, but I tell people that you know, 95%, I would say, of people absolutely love it. And if anything, they wish they had it done sooner um, because it does feel like a regular hip. It does take, people are generally feeling pretty pretty good, I would say at four weeks, pretty great at four months, and in about a year, they're not even thinking about it anymore. Um, just feels like they're hip, so as it should. So that's that, and there's another picture. You can kind of see what the stem looks like. You saw it before um, in the bone, but that's what it looks like out of the bone. It's a very, it's, it's pretty light. Um, that rough area over there, that's where the bone actually grows into the implant. It's friction that holds it in place initially, and then over time, the bone grows into the implant, becomes part of your body. All right. All Let's right. Turn it over to uh, Dr. Miller. Did you have anything else to say about? That? Oh yeah, I mean, I I, I actually will summarize a, a, a few because people. I, I mean, I'll tell you what I tell people um, if they're interested in surgery. Um, you know, expectations. I think expectations with hip replacement should be certainly fairly high. Like I said, people usually love it. Uh, it's a very successful surgery. Uh, as far as anesthesia, I can speak for myself. Um, the large majority uh, of patients, I think, in the practice are getting spinals, uh, spinal anesthesia, uh, plus medicine to put them out so they're not, they don't care what's going on. Uh, and then a lot of the times we may decide to inject some uh, medicine around it hip tissue itself. Um, surgery itself, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour for the implant to go in. You're in the OR for a couple hours total. Uh, there are risks and benefits of surgery. Um, there's kind of a laundry list of that. I can review that in person. Um, as far as length of stay in the hospital, patients go up to the floor. You know, these days we're having patients leave usually, usually the same day or the day after surgery, usually. Most patients do go home. Some people do go to a rehab facility, but we strongly encourage people to go home if they can. Uh, and then as far as follow-up is current, concerned, we call patients afterwards to make sure they're doing okay. Uh, there's physical therapy. Physical therapists are coming to the house for the first week or two. That transitions to outpatient therapy when they're ready. First visit back is four weeks. Like I said, four weeks, most patients are feeling pretty good. Um, at four months, most patients are feeling pretty great. And everyone sees improvements up to a year after their hip replacement. And then other things, driving, I tell people, uh, you know, we want people to be using a cane as opposed to a walker at that point, not taking narcotics when they're driving. It usually takes about two to three weeks after hip replacement to do that. And as far as work is concerned, I think this is helpful for people that are working or not working just to get an idea of function. Um, I tell people to take it easy for six weeks, do their therapy, walk, but don't, don't go crazy. 
and then slowly step up their activity. Um, I tell people to plan on two months off for a desk job, three months off for an on your feet all day job. There's definitely variability with that. Uh, I mean, had waitresses go back two weeks after surgery, uh, but it's good to just kind of plan ahead in that regard. I think that's kind of a fair recovery plan. Uh, I think uh, that's pretty much it. Noting, it's worth noting how that's changed over the years, you know? Like, like these used to be major operations where you'd stay in the hospital for a week or two afterwards. But, you know, exactly what Dr. Sage was saying, you know, a, a lot of people are going home. Most of the people are going home the same day, if not, you know, the following morning. Exactly. All right. So uh, I'm Dr. Miller, and, and I'll talk about total knee replacement. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll um, talk a little bit about um, use of the robot. Dr. Uh, Sage and I both use a, a robot um, or that we'll, we'll talk about in a second here, and then we'll uh, get to some of these questions at the end. Um, so, you know, normal knee anatomy, um, you got your, your thigh bone, your femur, your kneecap, the patella, and uh, the tibia is your shin bone. And the knee joint is you know, most people think of it as kind of the, um, the connection between the femur and the, the shin bone, but um, some people can forget that the kneecap also um, is an element of that. And, you know, with regards to arthritis, people can have it either between the femur and the tibia bone or even between the kneecap um, in the groove that the, the patella sits in um, on the femur, part of the bone called the trochlea. Um, so much like the, the hip, these are a couple examples of some, some x-rays. The x-ray on the, the right, um, like Dr. Sage was saying, it, it kind of looks like the bones are floating, and, and that's because the ends of the bone and good healthy you know, joints have a good thick layer of what's called articular cartilage. And that cartilage doesn't have bone in it. It's not ossified, so it, it shows up as clear on the x-rays. And if you compare it to that x-ray on the right, um, you see that those bones are not floating. That's because you've worn through all the cartilage there. Um, so, so this is somebody with, with end-stage osteoarthritis um, of the medial aspect of the knee. Um, like Dr. Sage, you, you know, just another thing, emphasizing the importance of, of weight management. Um, and, and for some reason, uh, for some people, that can be a problem. And, and you know, we just want you to know that we have resources available. Um, to help get your weight down. And, and a lot of the times people can have, you know, arthritic, painful knees. And then once they shed a few pounds off, they, they start getting a little bit more active and they start noticing that, you know, there's less force on that joint. And, and sometimes that can delay them needing a knee replacement for a year or two. Um, so again, um, we've got, I'll, I'll show it at the end after the presentation, but I've, I've got a little model here. Um, just kind of demonstrating both of the, the hip replacements and the knee replacement um, and just showing how the implants kind of sit in. Um, but in general, um, basically what happens is, um, you, you know, the, we haven't reached the part um, scientifically in our field where we're able to regrow cartilage. So, so that's sometimes a question that some people will ask. That's still kind of the holy grail in, in orthopedic surgery. And until we figure out how to really truly regrow the cartilage, our only option treating it surgically is, is essentially by cutting out the cartilage and replacing it with metal and plastic. Um, and, and over time, these implants have evolved. They have much better wear properties. They're lasting much longer. Um, it used to be in both the, the hip and knee replacements, this plastic component that lies between the two metal aspects that used to wear out um, and, and the manufacturers have figured out a way to make this plastic last much longer so that you know it used to wear out over the, the span of five to ten years and now they're lasting much longer than that and it's it's not uncommon that um, you know joint replacements end up outlasting the patients that they get put into. Um, and then with regards to the knee is, you know, something I kind of hinted at, there are different aspects of the knee that can develop arthritis. So in, in certain select populations, uh, and, and definitely emphasis on select populations, sometimes you can do a partial knee replacement. If all the arthritis is, is oftentimes, it, or can be isolated in one part of the joint. As is often the case, if you have arthritis in one part of the joint, usually the cartilage is, is pretty bad in the rest of the joint. 
So I would say in, in, in my practice, the vast majority of people, they end up needing total knee replacements. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Dr. Sage. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, that's my finding as well. And, and sometimes, you know, if, if you go in with the plan of doing a partial knee replacement, it's always under the understanding that if we get in there and it looks like your arthritis is, is worse off, you may leave with, with a total knee replacement. Um, and these are some x-rays of, of what these implants look like once they're in the body. Um, so all this, you, you know, the, the bright white is what the implant is. What doesn't show up is that plastic component between them. Um, and so you have a plastic component both between the, the thigh bone and the shin bone, but you also have one underneath the kneecap too oftentimes. Um, and this is an example on the left side of, of what a partial knee replacement looks like. Um, and these are what these implants, you know, physically look like. Um, so much like the, the hip replacement, um, there's, and there's, there are a couple ways of putting in the implants. In some people with real good bone, um, there are even what are called press fit implants meaning these little pores, these little trabeculations, we call them, on the underside of this, um, of the metal, the bone will actually kind of grow into that. And that's the way of securing in place. And that's how most of the total hips are done. I would say still the, the vast majority of total knees are still done cemented. Um, but again, in, in certain patients, you know, with, with good healthy bone, oftentimes we can do that without cementing it in. Um, and then this is, you know, what, what the robot looks like. Um, and, and both Dr. Sage and I use the robot. Um, it's called the Mako robot. Um, and we use that to, to help us put in these implants. And, and it really allows us to dial in precisely locating where the actual implant goes. And, and the idea behind that, and there's some evidence that I'll present here in a second, um, is that it, um, you know, has multiple benefits. Um, and, you know, Dr. Sage and I are, have been quick to adopt new technology. And I, I think, you know, we're, we're helping our patients out by offering this technology to them. Um, so with regards to total knee replacement, um, we're, we're seeing lower pain scores using the robot. Um, the idea behind that is, is more precise bone cuts you don't have to expose as much of the bone to, to put in the implant. Um, and because you're not traumatizing the soft tissues, that results in less pain. And the idea being that less pain means a quicker recovery, gets you up on your feet quicker um, and, and that much quicker on the path to recovery. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll highlight this uh, with, with regards to the total hip, accurate placement of the components. Um, one of, one of, and Dr. Sage didn't really get into it much, but one of the problems that some people can have after hip replacement is, is, and one of the risks is dislocation of that prosthesis. One of the ways you protect that is by putting these implants in a position where the hip joint is more stable and less apt to, to dislocate. Um, and this is just kind of some, some history of it. So it, it's been in existence of, um, you know, it, in the orthopedic realm for about 14 years. And each year it's, it's kind of been fine tuned along the way and we're getting better and better at, at applying it. And, and that's important to note because, you know, you don't want your surgeon being the first one trying any sort of new technology. So you, you want it to have a track record because oftentimes, you know, the first time doing something, sometimes those patients end up being guinea pigs and, and you want a solid track record behind it. Um, and the robot has been, you know, proven to be safe and effective and, and beneficial to patient care. Um, some people will ask how the robot actually works and, and whether it's the robot that's actually doing the surgery. Um, and, and that's kind of a, a, a misnomer. Basically what the robot is, is beforehand people will get a CT scan of the joint. Um, and then you're aligning the bony anatomy when you're in the operating room. Then you're using the, the robot. It, it's essentially a robotic arm that knows exactly where it is in relation to the bone. Um, so th the benefits with knee replacement is it won't let you cut into a zone that you don't want to be cutting in. And it also allows you to dial in how those components are placed so that the idea being that you're, you're making a more natural feeling prosthesis. 
and, and same with the, the total hip. Um, the, the robot comes in and, and that's part of what can grind out the old, um, the old cartilage and, and impact that new, um, the new socket that gets put in. Um, so this is just kind of some example of the software that we're, we're using when we're in there. This is for the total knee. Um, so the, the upper left-hand corner, the green is, is the sample implant. So, so we get to see in real time what the implant we want to put in is, is going to look like. And it tells us in real time measurements how tight different parts of the knee are. When you're done, and this is the, the job of the surgeon, our job is to give you a nice stable knee that feels consistent throughout all knee range of motion. Inevitably, a, a knee replacement, a hip replacement, it's going to feel a little different than your normal anatomy. Nothing's as good as, as the bone in, in the joint that we were born with. But the idea being, we're using the, the robot to make this feel as natural as possible. So this, this slide just kind of highlights some of the, uh, some of the benefits. Less post-operative pain, uh, less need for physical therapy after, quicker discharge. Quicker discharge gets you home sleeping in your bed quicker. Um, less pain means less opiates. You know, opiates are a big problem in our society today. Um, narcotics, people have problems with those medications. So the sooner we can get them off afterwards, the, the better they're going to do in the long run. Um, and, and Dr. Sage touched on this a little bit, um, and this is just kind of a, a, a brief timeline. Um, so how it happens, you, you know, we, we manage you in the office, and, and you know, certainly our, our number one goal is, is to do everything we can before surgery. Um, and, and once the kind of conservative treatment options are no longer working, and it's really affecting your quality of life, that's when we talk about surgery. We have a whole team that helps us um, make sure that you're as safe and as healthy as you can be going into surgery so that we can help limit any sort of complication afterwards. And then afterwards, um, you know, oftentimes we'll get physical therapy and visiting nurses to come and check on you afterwards if you end up going home. Most people do not end up needing to go to any sort of rehab facility, but if certain circumstances require that, then certainly we set that up. Um, and then we follow you afterwards um, until we're, we're confident that you're, you know, progressing along nicely. Um, and then afterwards, it's worthwhile doing surveillance on these to make sure that these implants are lasting up. So um, certainly we, we see you back at, at the one year mark. Um, and then with different surgeons, it's different. But then, you know, several years afterwards to keep checking in on you and make sure everything's still holding up okay. Um, and then in terms of recovery, um, much to, to what Dr. Sage was saying, in the hospital, you know, usually about a day, um, most people are, are, more and more people are going home the same day, if not kind of staying one or two days afterwards. And then you're, you're doing, you know, what you, what you want to be doing in terms of just daily around the house activities um, several weeks after. And then you're continuing to get stronger, continuing to get a feel for what this new hip or knee feels like. Um, and, and, you know, at about the six to 12 month mark, somewhere in there, and everyone recovers different, but most people are feeling pretty good at that time. With the idea being that, you know, we're trying to get you back to the things that you like to do, whether it's golfing or biking, or just going for a walk or, you know, around Berkshire County, we've got great hikes everywhere, so. Um, this next, you, you know, there are some limitations. You, you, you aren't going back doing, uh, you know, playing full-time, you know, rugby or anything like that. Um, but, you know, most people are, are still able to ski and, and run on them even. Um, but, you, you know, we kind of tailor that on a patient-by-patient on a -patient basis. Just some disclaimer, and, and that's, um, you know, kind of it for, for our presentation. So what do you think, Dr. Sage? Do you want to get to some of these questions now? Sure, yeah. Okay, so uh, first question, how soon after the hip plant implant can the patient walk? Same day. Uh, we have mo the large majority of our patients, we have them walking the same day of surgery. Uh, we get them going fast. Um, gel injections, uh, 
I can, I'll just answer a few of these. Gel injections. Uh, so this is your story with gel injections. Uh, not generally the hip, the knee, yes. There are a bunch of different ones in the market. Uh, as far as whether they work or not, it depends on who you talk to. So there are, as far as the available evidence is concerned, uh, the evidence is, is not great that gel injections work uh, compared to just putting a bunch of saline inside the knee. Uh, this is true. Uh, that being said, um, I've kind of swung more back to the middle uh, with gel injections to the knee because I, I do have some patients that have come back uh, wanting more injections. They've had six, eight months um, of relief. Uh, so I'm not sure what the deal is, that whether the literature is just miss, missing a certain portion of the population. You know, it's hard to believe that's just placebo. It's giving relief for six to eight months. So uh, I think they could potentially work in some people. It's something uh, worth trying. Uh, one, and uh, One thing, one thing to note on it, some, some insurances cover it, sometimes yeah. an out-of-pocket cost. So that's something, at least in my practice, I kind of approach it on a, a patient by patient basis. If it's going to be six, $800 out of pocket and people haven't had them and they don't know if they work and they've got real bad arthritis, I tend to steer them away. If their arthritis isn't bad, um, then sometimes they can be beneficial. And the way they work, um, they essentially act as a, as a lubricant. Um, to the joint, whereas steroid injections are a very strong anti-inflammatory. So with arthritis, when you've got bad cartilage and bone on bone wear, that creates a lot of infl inflammation in the knee. So that's where steroid injections kind of really shine is kind of reducing the inflammation, providing that sort of pain control. In real bad arthritis, lubricants can be helpful but I find them they're usually less, less influential than, than steroid injections. Yeah, that's been my finding as well. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, as far as how long does a hip replacement normally last? Um, for most people, it should last your whole life. Uh, I think the exception to that, if you're in the very rare category of knee replacement, hip replacement in your 20s, uh, which is highly unusual, not impossible, but you know, most people are getting their hips replaced in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and uh, hip replacement really is built to last. It really should outlive uh, the individual unless you're planning on setting any records. So, uh, so that's the answer to that. Uh, the difference between different types of hip replacements, yes, I, get, I, I, could, I could spend a whole separate talk on this. Um, different approaches. So this is the deal. The best, the, the best literature that's come out in regards to uh, the different approaches is out of the Mayo Clinic. Um, they compared the direct anterior approach and the posterior approach. They did not compare the, they didn't throw the direct superior approach into that. So I can only speak to the anterior versus posterior. What they found is the advantage to the direct anterior approach was recovery by about five days quicker. I don't mean walking five days quicker. I mean, reaching certain physical therapy milestones, um, such as weaning off of a cane, alternating uh, feet when you're going up and down stairs, those kinds of things. Uh, there are also downsides to going through the front. Uh, there's a multi-center study looking at that and there's a higher risk of implant loosening. Uh, so that's kind of a downside. Downside to going through the back, you've gotta be on hip precautions, a slightly higher risk of dislocation. So you know, as to whether any uh, particular approach is uh, superior to any other approach. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that despite aggressive advertising. Uh, but, you know, some approaches are more appropriate than others. Certainly an individual who practices like extreme yoga and twists in all sorts of different positions probably would be better uh, with an anterior approach. So I think there's probably a subpopulation of people that would benefit from that. Uh, but for most people, I don't think it makes too much of a difference. I'll turn it over to you, Ashley. Yeah, no, and I would agree with that sentiment. The, the anterior approach is very in vogue right now. Um, the posterior approach has a long proven track record. Um, and, and, you know, once people have severe enough arthritis, you know, the day of the surgery, you know, once they're in the recovery area, most people feel a noticeable difference. And, and that's just not having that constant grinding, in their, that constant groin pain. And they feel a difference right from the get-go, whether the approach was anterior or posterior. 
or even, or even lateral. So yeah, I would agree with that sentiment. Does BMC have outpatient surgery program? Um, so ish, I, I guess is, is my answer. Um, so this is something that we've been working on. Um, currently since the pandemic, um, I guess it's, it's not a true dedicated outpatient surgery program, but a lot of our patients are leaving the same day. So we found that it, it's just safer to admit them to the floor um, after surgery. They're getting up, working with physical therapy that afternoon, doing all the milestones that they would need to do. Um, and, and then if they're comfortable and their pain's controlled and they're moving well, then they'll go home that evening. Um, so in, in that regard, it's, it's very similar to an outpatient program. It ends up being a, about a six hour admission for, for these people, but we find it's just a little safer. And then if, if they're not comfortable or they're hesitant to go home, um, then it's very easy for them to just stay overnight. All right, I am in my 50s and worried that I will wear out my joint and need another replacement. Is that too difficult or have chances of failure? Um, I would say I would say no, it, it's certainly not difficult and, and we do joint replacements in 50s. Um, much to what Dr. Sage was saying, it's, it's, it's one thing if, if you've got some sort of adolescent problem where you need a knee a hip replacement oftentimes, usually not knee replacements at that age, but certain people have skeletal dysplasias and stuff where that can be the case. Um, but what I was saying earlier is these implants are lasting much longer. Um, there may, you know, depending on what sort of forces you're putting on, how much wear and tear you're, and how active you are, you know, how, how big of a person you are, bigger people end up putting more force through the joints. Um, but for most people, they are lasting much longer than they used to be. And, and part of that is, is just how we've figured out how to manufacture the, the, the plastic component um, between the knees here. So this little poly component has such good wear properties that they're lasting much longer. Um, and then we're, we're figuring out how to, how to do these where we're saving bone and not you know, sacrificing as much bone so that in the event that it needs a replacement or, or sorry, a revision down the line, um, you, you know, we haven't burned too many bridges. I'll just chime in one other thing there. Uh, you know, as far as in your 50s, uh, you know, we, um, Dr. Miller mentioned briefly about um, cementless implants. I do, you do quite a few cementless implants. And certainly in your 50s, odds are your bone quality is quite good. I, I've actually put them in and um, older populations as well. Um, but yeah, the idea with that is that one of the reasons that implants fail besides wearing out the plastic is something called aseptic loosening of the joint. There's usually with a cemented implant, there's cement that bonds the implant to the joint and it acts as a grout. Uh, and there's a proportion of the population uh, over a long period of time where that grout starts to break down and the implant loosens. Cementless implants, the idea, it kind of functions like uh, Dr. Miller mentioned, like the hip. It's friction that holds it in place initially and the bone grows into the implant, becomes a part of the body. Theoretically, uh, that should eliminate one potential cause of revision. Uh, so that's, that's, another, uh, that's another advantage there. So. And if it does end up needing a revision, you're not trying to get all this cement out that is interdigitated. Exactly, makes it an easier job. Absolutely. All right, after total knee replacement, can you squat down and stand up from there? Um, yes, yep. So um, yeah, and we, we get you moving right from the get-go. Um, things really kind of tighten up after the surgery from the swelling um, and, and all the trauma to the soft tissues. Um, but you're moving around that same day. Um, usually it takes several weeks before you can really get into a deep squat. Um, usually we're pretty happy if people have about 120 degrees of motion. Um, which is something that, uh, you know, that's a very functional range of motion that you would have from that. Um, we don't do a lot in like baseball catchers. That's something where you're kind of squatting down all the time, but there aren't any limitations to what you can do, especially as you kind of progress through your motion post-operatively. I have heard that there are custom implants that are better for certain ethnic populations. Is that true? I, I, I've never put in any of the custom implants. Do you have any experience with them? 
No, I mean, I can tell you, um, I would not be surprised if that information was floating around on the internet, but as to whether there's any sort of solid scientific backing, I can tell you for certain that's not discussed at our big national conferences. So um, I think that probably remains to be seen at this point. And there's, there's certainly, you know, we have different size inference. It's not one size fits all with this. There's a lot of modulations we're putting these in. Here's one for hip arthritis, Dan. Do you want to answer that one? I'm sure, yeah. So yoga practitioner, I'm a yoga practitioner and I have hip arthritis. Well, uh, will I be able to return to doing yoga after hip replacement? Uh, the answer is yes. I think you can certainly return to doing yoga. I did mention before about... Uh, you know, different surgical approaches in this one particular scenario, uh, depending on what you're doing for yoga, you want might you might want to consider um, going through, you know, an, a direct anterior approach versus a posterior approach. And that, that depends. I mean, I do the posterior approach. I practice, I, I work on people that practice yoga, but it just depends how kind of extreme you want to be. Um, any hip replacement can be popped out uh, no matter what surgical approach is. So that's an important discussion to have with your surgeon. I've heard that knee replacement is very painful and recovery takes several months. Is that true? Um, I would say that it's, it's certainly more painful than hip replacement. Um, that being said, a, a lot of evidence um, in our research, in our field, has been targeted towards pain control. Um, and it starts, you know, from before the surgery even. Um, things that we're doing, we, we've got longer lasting um, injections to do in, in all the soft tissues, all the muscles, all the um, around the bone and everything. Um, you get a nerve block beforehand. Um, so usually the, the first 24 hours or so, it actually ends up being pretty comfortable. Sometimes what can happen is that those nerve blocks and everything can work almost too good. So if you don't have any pain medication in your system, then when those nerve blocks wear off, that's when it can kind of hit you. So usually they're kind of most painful in the first 48 hours or so, um, and then pain kind of gradually improves. Um, so it, it's important to have that expectation going into it that, um, you know, this is, it's a pretty major surgery and it, it's definitely a big whack on your body. Um, so it's, it's, you're, you're definitely going to have some soreness. Um, but I would say that the, the vast majority of people are doing just fine by a week, even two weeks. Are there pre and post-operative exercises that need to be done if it is robotic surgery, force therapeutics? Also, why would robotic not be used in some surgeries? Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll answer the last one first. Um, these surgeries, uh, you know, I, I view the robot, and I don't know what your thoughts are, Dr. Sage, I view it as, you know, kind of a supplemental element to surgery, and I think it provides something else. Certainly, the surgery is still, you know, the implants can still be put in without use of the robot, um, and, and not everybody does it. For some people, it, it's cumbersome, and they don't want to learn the new technology, um, but for other people, I, I think it only adds something to the surgery and only helps things. Um, and, and that's why, you know, I've chosen to use it. Um, and, and this is really, you know, hip replacement and, and knee replacement. We don't use it for any sort of arthroscopic surgery. We don't use it in traumas for fracture management. It's not used in hand surgery. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of limited in its scope of use really to joint replacement right now. Um, and, and certainly there are pre and, and post-operative exercises. So um, you know, most people get going with physical therapy. Um, our practice has adopted this app for people to use on their phones called Force Therapeutics. Um, and and what, is, what it is, is it's kind of a centralized resource for everything after surgery. There are examples of exercises to do at different time frames after surgery. Um, and, and beforehand, you know, everybody everybody thinks of therapy as after the surgery, and certainly that's something that's very important of recovery. But there's also the idea of preoperative therapy or prehabilitation, where we want your muscles as strong and as flexible in terms of the joint as you can be going into surgery. 
because you will lose muscle mass from the surgery um, and, and you will get stiff. So the more motion and the stronger you are going into surgery, the easier it is to recover. Can you explain about a cortisone injection for a hip and about how long it would last? Okay, I can talk about that a little bit. So uh, I, can I can just speak for myself. I don't know what Dr. Miller's thought is on this. I'm a little bit more careful with cortisone injections for the hip than the knee. I routinely uh, use cortisone for conservative management for knee arthritis. For hips, I do as well once in a while. Uh, as far as why that is, um, the concern has to do with uh, another protect a particular hip pathology called avascular necrosis of the hip. Um, that's when the blood supply to the bone in the hip is disrupted and the bone starts to die. Sometimes this can overlap with arthritic findings on x-ray and it's sometimes difficult to tell on x-ray. Um, if you put steroid in, and one of the causes of avascular necrosis is systemic steroids and the thought is, is that if you put in a cortisone injection inside a hip that has avascular necrosis, it could potentially accelerate uh, uh, how bad it is. And I have seen that happen before um, with cortisone injections where someone has a hip and they get a cortisone injection and then the hip just kind of dissolves. So um, I'm, I'm very careful with that. If people do request cortisone injections to the hip, I generally uh, like to get, have them get an MRI uh, of their hip to make sure they don't have underlying avascular necrosis uh, before doing that. As far as how long it lasts, um, it's been highly variable. I've seen some people where it lasts a couple months. Other people say, I got it nine months ago and it finally is starting to wear off. So it's kind of all over the place I've seen with, with, with um, cortisone injections to the hip. They can be helpful though in certain populations. And another area where it can be helpful, sometimes we're not sure whether the pain is, is coming from the hip joint itself. So, you know, there's, there's this idea of a diagnostic and a therapeutic injection. Therapeutic to provide pain relief. Diagnostic, there, there's a numbing element to the injection. So if your pain relief, if you get kind of full pain relief from a, a steroid injection in the hip joint, then we know that you know this this pain isn't coming from the back. It's not coming from the muscles. That it is coming from the hip joint. So that that can be another instance where it can be useful. Uh, if both knees are bad, do you wait for one to heal before doing the other? In very rare circumstances, bilateral total knees can be done. But my my preference is always to to do one, let you recover. And then see if you see if you like it. See if you want to go through that that process again, um, and, and make sure you're fully healed, because the rehab it, it's very hard to do the rehabilitation if if both knees are hard and, and you don't have a good leg to walk on. So you know, in, in my practice, I, I definitely encourage people to do it one and then the other. I don't know about you, Doctor. I'm I'm the same way. I, I tend to uh, bilateral hip. Bilateral knee replacements are extraordinarily difficult to go through. Um, I like to see my patients after they have their knee done uh, four weeks after surgery and see how they're doing. Some patients might say, you know what, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, sign me up for the next one. And some patients are saying, you know what, that was a really tough run. I think I need some more time. And uh, I think that's probably a better way to go about it and uh, just doing both at once. How do you feel about stem cell therapy instead of a replacement? Um, you know, the, the role of stem cells is, is kind of ever evolving. Um, if you get to the point where your arthritis is, is bad enough that you're even thinking about a, a replacement, stem cell therapy is, is not going to be a magic cure. Um, it, it will not regrow the cartilage. It will not restore the joint. Um, it, it's much better for, for more minor pathology. Um, how long does knee and hip replacement last? We kind of talked about that. My original knee replacement was 19 years ago. It has given me pain. How do you change your replacement? Um, so that that's a, a lengthy a, a lengthy answer, unfortunately. But um, essentially, what you do is you've got to figure out why it's it's causing pain, and sometimes that can be because the components have loosened up on their own. Sometimes it can be painful because there's a, a low-grade infection in there. 
Um, and depending on the cause, it's different treatment. Sometimes it can be as simple as, you know, just the plastic component between the knee has just worn out. And if, it, if that's the case and, and we make sure there's no infection or, or any other causes of pain, sometimes that can be as easy as popping in a new plastic component. Sometimes it, it involves taking all these components out and treating an infection, which can be a, a very lengthy process. So there's no short answer. It kind of depends on, on why it's painful and why it's causing you trouble. Sometimes it involves replacing the hip. <laughs> the, the dad, that is true. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes it's unrelated to the knee replacement and it's just, uh, could be other issues going on and sometimes hip related pain refers down to the knee and it turns out it's the issues in the hip. So uh, it's important to make sure that it's the, the knee replacement that's the problem. Good point. I've heard platelet rate, wait, oh, I can never say it. Platelet rich plasma therapy for knee pain. Can you tell us more about that? Um, so basically how it works is, is you take some blood off and you isolate the platelets and, and more it's the plasma in there. Um, and, and the plasma is the element of the blood that has a lot of healing potential. Um, with the idea being that you're going in and it, it's providing some healing potential back in the knee. Um, again, for, for significant arthritis, that's, that's not a magic cure. Um, people are doing it more for, for intact cartilage um, and more kind of soft tissue injuries. I, I don't have a lot, it, admittedly, I, I do not have a lot of experience with it. I don't know if you have any PRP elements in your practice, Dan. I, I don't, I, I don't think it's, I think it's probably mixed as far as the results in the literature are concerned. I think probably the one difference between PRP and the visco supplementations, you know, the gel injections is that I, there are some insurance companies that do cover the gel injections Medicare certainly covers gel injections. I'm not aware of insurance companies that cover PRP. I think a lot of people are paying out of pocket for that. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I, I believe that's the case. And it can be expensive too. Yep. Does knee replacement cause significant leg swelling? When everything is, is fully recovered, um, it, it should not cause significant leg swelling. You can definitely have some swelling afterwards from the surgery. Gravity will pull all that swelling and edema down the leg. Um, sometimes you can get swelling from a, a blood clot after surgery. Again, not normal, but um, you know that, that's one thing. There could be numerous causes of, of leg swelling. But after full recovery and everything, we would not expect your leg to be swollen. Does radio pulse ablation help relieve pain in new knee? I have no experience in radio pulse ablation. I don't, I don't either. I think there are some other interesting technologies out there, um, but I can't, I don't have any personal experience with that. We apologize, James. Um, is there a lot of swelling with the knee replacement? How long would it last? Um, so, so initially, you, you know, there's, there's blood loss, there's edema from the surgery and, and the knee can swell up. Um, the swelling gets better from week to week. Um, most people aren't terribly swollen at two weeks. Um, most people are kind of back to normal at about six weeks. Um, do you replace the patella in knee replacement? That is the million dollar question. And again, something that has had a lot of research devoted to it. Um, it kind of depends on, on where you're trained and there are different philosophies. Um, in Europe, very few people replace the patella. Um, in the U.S., it's, it's much more mixed, and, and there are, I would say, the pendulum is probably more in favor of replacing the patella. Um, I know I do. Um, and people that don't and, and kind of leave the native patella, if they end up having knee pain afterwards, in my hands, I'm always going to wonder if it was because I didn't replace the arthritic kneecap. So I am somebody that always replaces it. And I believe you do too, right now. I do. Yeah. I mean, and there's differing, I mean, I'm not sure it's just, uh, but in the, the American data definitely supports uh, replacing the patella um, as far as, you know, less, less risk of return to the OR for continued pain. Uh, but in Europe, it's a little bit of a different story. So hard to know what to make of that, but I, I, I choose to replace it as well. 
Uh, does insurance cover rehab and physical therapy? Yes, it would be exceptional if they did not. Does your program provide joint camp slash, slash class to the patients in order to prepare for the surgery? Yes, and, and you know that's a big element, really educating the patient and, and knowing what they're getting into. Um, we have a phenomenal course uh, nurse coordinator here, uh, Jessica Walden, who talks to all of our joint replacements ahead of time, um, and she's kind of a liaison afterwards. She helps coordinate everything and, and you know, make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, do most knee replacement patients eventually need two? Having pain in both knees, one is diagnosed as being in need of replacement, other has not been looked at. Thought was to get through the first knee and then check the other. Um, so in that regard, it's, it's not uncommon to have arthritis in both knees. It's not uncommon to really just have arthritis in, in one knee. Um, you know, it, it's certainly worth having both knees checked out so that you know what you're kind of dealing with. Um, and, and that way you can kind of have expectations moving forward. Um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's certainly worthwhile to, if you're thinking about the surgery, have it done first and, and see exactly what Dr. Sage was saying. See how you feel about it before, you know, going into the other, the knee. Um, but, you know, the other knee may just need kind of a steroid injection to, to help kind of buy you some time as you're kind of recovering through the other affected knee. How does osteoporosis affect knee replacements? Um, so certainly, you know, when you're, when you're talking about those, what we call the press fit implants, the non-cemented implants, um, they're not good to put in osteoporosis because the bone quality is, is not as good. Um, so with regards to osteoporosis, um, we can still do surgery and, and everything, um, but usually those are more likely to require cemented components. Can implants become infected years after surgery? Uh, short answer is, is yes, it can, it can be infected at any time. Um, and, and periprosthetic joint infection can be a major problem. It's not common, but when it happens, it, it can be a, a real problem to deal with. Um, and yes, it can happen years down the line. Sometimes um, it can be as simple as, as getting an infection somewhere else in the body. Um, and then the bacteria can get in the bloodstream and get to the knee or the hip replacement. Um, and because there isn't blood supply in the, the metal components, sometimes those bacteria can latch on. It can be, become very hard to eradicate them. Um, are blood clots common after joint surgery? Not common, um, but we know they're out there and we know they, they exist. So that's why um, most patients um, end up being on aspirin afterwards just to thin the blood a little bit. Um, the other important protection against blood clots are getting up, moving around um, and, and being active with it. Being active on that leg increases blood flow throughout the veins um, and helps prevent blood clots. Um, but they're not common, you know, one, two percent, if that, not even, but less than one percent. I live alone. Could I function by myself after knee surgery? Um, so, again, short answer is, is yes. Um, part of the preoperative planning process is, is trying to optimize your living situation, whether it's a friend or a family member that can come and spend some time with you afterwards. Um, you're, 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 most people are functional. Um, you're moving up, you're gonna be in pain. So, you know, the first week or two after surgery, it's definitely beneficial to have somebody around with you. Um, and, and it's kind of on a case by case basis. If we don't think you're safe to go home by yourself, then that's, that's oftentimes the role of the short term nursing facility, rehab facility, um, to get you, you know, kind of temporarily in a transition zone until you're strong enough to get back on your feet to, to be independent again. Once it is safer to travel, is it necessary to carry a card that says you have a hip or knee replacement? I would say it's not necessary. Some people ask for them. Um, on the, the scanners at the airports and everything, 
they can tell if, if you have a knee or a hip replacement. Um, so we used to kind of give out cards all the time. Now I, I rarely do personally. I think we still have them in the clinic if yeah. you want one, but you don't need one. How does BMC's infection rate compare to elsewhere? Uh, we have a very low infection rate. I believe we're lower than the national average. I don't have the stats though. Yeah, I, I'd like to chime in there. Um, as far as that is concerned, I think part of the reason our infection rate is so low is because we're extraordinarily careful as far as when we decide uh, to proceed uh, with joint replacement. And sometimes that means canceling surgeries. Sometimes that means um, delaying surgeries. You know, when someone gets infected, um, there are risk factors that we pay a lot of attention to. So, you know, diabetics have twice the rate of infection as non-diabetics. And so we, we're really, we're, we're pretty adamant about making sure their sugars are under good control um, before surgery and after surgery to reduce the risk. Um, rheumatoid arthritis patients, uh, four times the risk there. Um, a lot of them are these really powerful anti-rheumatic drugs, but we're careful about when they stop them and when they start them because if they start them too soon after surgery, that's a risk of infection. Malnutrition is a risk of infection. Um, morbid obesity is a risk if people are morbidly obese. If their body mass index is very high, we insist that they lose uh, weight to reduce the risk. So part of that really is is planning uh, before surgery uh, as far as reducing that risk, uh, I think it's really critical. This is pretty, uh, our rate is less than half percent. Yes, it's very low. Yeah, I think the national average is closer to, to 1%, I believe. Uh, um, what do you, well done. What do you do if you, uh, what, do you bridge with the patient on Jantobin? Uh, that's similar to Coumadin, I believe. Um, so usually they get that put on um, usually Lovenox beforehand. Um, so so injections to still provide the kind of blood thinning that they need from the Jantobin, um, and then postoperatively we we get you back on it. Thank you, Marie. Does Medicare pay for full knee replacement? Yes. How long do patients stay on strict hip precautions? Are you a three or a six month kind of guy? Uh, um, I'm, a, I'm a six week person, although I, I will say that, that that's highly variable. And in fact, I think things are starting to change. So hip precautions uh, for posterior approach is no flexing your hip past 90 degrees, no internally ro rotating it, no bringing it across the midline for six weeks. Um, but you know, I probably will transition to what are called modified hip precautions. There are some facilities that are starting to do, do that. We're really, they just don't want patients com combining all those things at once. And that's really the only lifelong precaution. That's pretty awkward to do anyway, to tell you the truth. Um, and that's probably more of an issue of communicating with different physical therapy facilities because everyone kind of just assumes standard hip precautions. But I think there's some growing evidence to suggest that these modified hip precautions are probably okay to do. So, but yeah, six weeks for me. I'm more a three month kind of guy, but I'm, I'm a little more conservative. Um, what are general expectations for range of motion after full recovery with a knee replacement? Our, our goal would be, you know, zero to 120 degrees, which is, you know, you can do just about anything with, with that much motion. Some people get more, some people get less. It kind of depends what you're starting with too, um, how bad that arthritis is. Some people have, you know, like a, a flexion contracture of their knee where they can't get it all the way straight. Sometimes that can be hard to get that knee all the way straight afterwards. Definitely improved, but, you know, it, it's kind of, variable from patient to patient. But, you know, your run-of-the-mill knee replacement, I would expect people to have pretty close to full motion in their knee afterwards. Yeah, the biggest predictor of post-operative range of motion is pre-operative range of motion. So even though all these knees were getting at zero to 125 degrees in, in you know, on the table, as to whether people keep that is a different story entirely. I mean, a lot of people if they're flexing only to 90, 95 degrees, even though they're 125 in surgery, a lot of folks will kind of drift back to where they were. Although I try to tell people, um, I encourage them not to let, be dissuaded by that because I've definitely seen people that have 
you know, come in with 95 and then they come out with 130 and they keep it. So they kind of beat the odds too. So, uh, but that's kind of important to know that knee replacement is done for pain relief. Um, that's really the idea as, as opposed to, you know, improvements in range of motion may or may not be obtainable. And then final question here, do you refer patients for PT in their homes? Um, yeah, so, so usually that's done kind of in the initial post-operative period. Um, and, and there's a visiting nursing um, that we set that up through. So yes, they come. It, it's, it's not every day usually. It's usually a few times a week. But as, as soon as you're able to get into outpatient physical therapy, they can just do a lot more. They have better equipment, better space. Um, and, and you definitely make more progress when you're at a, a dedicated physical therapy place. But initially afterwards, um, yes, that is something that gets set up. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for coming out. Thanks for all the questions, and thanks for thank coming. everyone. Thank you, Dr. Miller and Sage.